Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Diary of a Cocaine Addict. Another episode is going live today. Um, and I'm really excited because today I've got an amazing guest. So for those of you that are new to this show, I am Sarah. I am the Recovery Witch. I am here to bring you this show, which is designed to be very real, very authentic, um, and provide you with hope, inspiration, guidance, insights, resources, all of the things to help you to come out of the darkness of addiction and into the light of recovery. And who better to share insights and all of that jazz with us than the fabulous Liz Turner. Now, we just had a conversation before we went live, and she said to me in these words, I've gone from um, heroin addicted sex worker to buying my own house. And I was like, there's my intro. <laughs> okay. So on that note, it's over to you, Liz. Please tell us who are you? How did you get to be here? All of the things we want to know. Oh, thank you. What a lovely introduction. Um, and thank you for asking me to come along and do this podcast. You know, the thing, there's many things that I do in the recovery community that I'm in. And one of them is sharing my story of giving people hope that actually this is possible. I was a destitute sex worker, heroin addict, and, you know, and I, heroin was my staple diet. Um, obviously, I used crack, you know, and I drank alcohol and I was, didn't even know and didn't even understand how, actually how broken I was, you know, and like my intro, then coming into recovery eight years ago, I'm not eight years um, um, abstinent because I work an abstinent program. I'm not eight <laughs> years abstinent, but um, my journey started, in all honesty, after my first jail sentence, after, after my last jail sentence, which was in 2005, which is when I decided that having my 30th birthday in jail just wasn't how wasn't I the thing, no? wasn't wasn't like wasn't cool. <laughs> Like, why am, why am I even here? Like, you know. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. But then it took a while to actually get into recovery and put down substances and really start to work on myself and uncover who I am. And, like, eight years later, I'm literally on the cuff of moving into my own home, and uh, which I'm purchasing for me and my child. My child's a recovery oh. baby. You know, he's never mm. seen me use. He's never seen me drink. He's never seen me... Um, sell myself on any kind of level but he's aware of recovery like he knows the language of recovery one thing that I'm really proud of is that being in recovery my son is very emotionally um intelligent so he'll sit me down and he'll tell me what's going on for him emotionally or if I like lose my head as parents do he'll sit down and say mum that wasn't okay that wasn't like and it's like this is a seven-year-old little boy and the <laughs> only thing that I can equate that to is being in recovery and working a program that I work so, yeah. For sure, for sure, yeah. they pick up on our energy, don't they? And so you leading with an energy that's much more calm and centered, and you know, emotionally dialed in, that will naturally transcend to him. So you should be very proud. I'm sure you are. Yeah. You know, and and you know, living, living a principle, living a spiritually principled life. You know, there's lots of spiritual principles, but just the basics, the the, the, the nourishment of each day of, of being authentic to self, being honest, being loyal, you know, have, having an open mind, being non-judgmental, all of these things that I instill in him, I know filters into his life as well. And they certainly the principles that I live by, by and by, by any means. I mean, I work a 12-step recovery program and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to blow anything more up than that. But for me, it was life-changing finding that and yeah and starting to understand my disease of addiction for me and you know, lots of people don't buy this script but for me I see where my disease manifests without drugs like so for me at the minute it's making money <laughs> I can be obsessive about it and or shopping or um that one little thing I want to get like for me it was it, it's paid dividends being obsessive about buying this house because all my ducks in a row like, yeah Wearable skills of when I was obsessive about using drugs and using alcohol and getting off my face, transferring them into recovery, I've become that obsessive that I'm now buying my own home. Like that's so, incredible. Yeah, it is. So tell us, Liz, because I'm sure people are thinking, how the heck did you even become a sex worker in the first place, and how did you get yourself out of it? Right, brilliant question. Um, I don't ever think it was kind of a conscious decision of mine. Um, my first sexual experience, I was 11, um, and the guy was 21. So, wow. 
Uh, yeah, and I, I suppose today it would be more it would be called grooming. But what, I mean, I'm like 47 this year, so no. like back then it was like it just happened, you know. And I I speak to a lot of girls that had the same experience of me that even today I struggle to call it what it is. It was rape. I was 11 yeah. years old. He was a 21 year old man. If yeah. I saw a grown man approach 11 year old girl today, my reaction would not be kind. Back no. then it wasn't there wasn't this language and it wasn't really spoken about. And because I came from a, I'm just going to go with dysfunctional family because both my parents are dead, so I'm not even going to uh, touch that. Sure. Because, that, because they're dead. I end yeah. on. Yeah. Um, because I came from a dysfunctional family and desperate to belong and desperate to be loved, this guy was able to do this. And I was kind of like that. Oh, mm, he yes. must think I'm special. He must think I'm important. He must think so much of me to do this thing to me. You don't know any better than you at that age. I ain't got you ain't got a clue at that age. That's why we have a legal age of consent. Do you know what I mean? Because of that age, you don't you can't form Mm -hmm. proper decision making skills. But um, and off the back end of that, it became the norm. It became and not just with him, it was kind of like being passed around. But um, but off the back end of that, then drugs quickly became my staple diet. You know, uh, you know, heroin came a little bit la- later on after my first jail sentence. Uh, that's when I started using heroin. Mm-hmm. So I was about, you know, 18, 19, 20 when, th- when that came into my life. But, you know, it was all the party drugs. It was coke. It was ecstasy. And what I kind of like to say is, what have you got? What have you got? And I'll take it. And unaware that at the time it was soothing something in me, like that void, that not feeling good enough, that feeling worthless but then everything I was doing was compounding those feelings so sex work after that point was just like a given it wasn't something that I consciously well you know I'm going to become a prostitute I'm going to become pretty woman yeah (laughs) I love how you can bring humor to this news that's so important it's so important it really is because for me and I'm only going to speak for me if I don't bring humor in I can live in that trauma Oh, like yes. and live in, you know, that, oh, woe is me. But actually, you know, it was a path that I was on. I didn't have a lot of parental guidance. I was a rebel because I was just seeking something. I was seeking attention. So it happened. It is what it is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So when did this start becoming like a paid thing? Like how did you seek that out when you were, you know, early teens? Um, it, well, it was all, I wouldn't say it was paid as in cash, but it was mm. certainly paid as in drugs. Okay. So there was always that um, transactional thing. And if it wasn't drugs and it was transactional, as in if I do that, then you're going to be okay. Not me, but the person that's fucking me. Oh, I shouldn't have said it like that. Okay, it's okay. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I'm it's sorry. quite all right. Do not worry. I am as well. Steve tries yeah. to tell me to tone it down and I just ignore him. <laughs> you know what? I kind of had this uh, like epiphany a, a while back. I was trying to tone down my swearing because my message is more powerful when I don't swear. So I do mm. try and tone it down, but I am a swearer. And um, sometimes... <laughs> It's a <laughs> uh, um, so it was always the the, the 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 sex that was done to me was always transactional. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and so when all this began, like you said where your head was at, you know, like this was about acceptance and validation and all of the things, like. What led you to the point where you realised that actually that wasn't, quote, unquote, normal? Recently. I mean, that's you. Um, if you said you're 40, what, 6, 47? Yeah, 47 this year. So I would say recently. 11. Yeah. So I would say that um, I, I believe it was quite normal. You know, even having that kind of language in my head, that actually, like, the sex work, they're the mugs playing for it you know, having that language, really not being aware of the void that was happening emotionally, spiritually, mentally, of giving myself as a transaction, whether it be for cash, whether it be for drugs, whether it was to be to make that person okay and soothe things over because I can't tolerate what would come off the back end of not doing Mm -hmm. it. And I would say for me, the last four years has been, like my father died four years ago, and that was a pivotal moment for me. Didn't have a yeah. relationship with him, but I felt like an abandoned child all over again. Oh, hello. Um, so when he died, I, I relapsed. I picked up, you know, after four years, and then, I don't know, something happened. 
something happened in me and I switched. Lots of things changed. I looked at lots of different parts in my life, did lots of outside help as well as this 12 step program. And today, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm mourning for the little girl that I was. And it's yeah. not something that I would, you know, you know, I have a very different view of it today. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's quite a story. I'm kind yeah. of. And kind of, <laughs> yeah, and kind of drugs, you know, was a um obviously to begin with, oh it was great, you know, smoking weed and doing ecstasy and doing coke. Oh yeah. It's fun. I, 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 well, great. But then I couldn't tell you when it became when that moment switched. Or yeah. when, you know, I, you know, it's it, it's not like I woke up one morning and I was injecting heroin, but it's kind of when that moment turned and it became a necessity to be able mm. to function, to be able to move through life yeah. because I needed to just switch this off yeah while I'm walking up I can't feel yeah so I only realized that the other day I was featured on my friend's podcast actually and as I was talking to her like obviously I've realized that you know I've got deep trauma um in the past which is what kind of led to my drug story but I hadn't made the link of like this persona that I created when I was out my nut, like this is my story, you know, when I was out my nut, I was so loud and I was so funny and people just wanted to be around me and I was very generous. And I'd consciously created this persona to stop myself from being hurt because of the grief that I hadn't expressed from my dad. And also I realized in the last couple of days, there was a boyfriend who broke my heart. Like I broke his first um, and then we split up and then he did exactly to me what I had done to him. Right. Not intentionally. But I've never felt a pain like it. And I said, I will never feel like that again. And I haven't. And I haven't since I was 23 because I just won't allow it. But it's interesting to me that even how I can link the trauma with my drug use, I hadn't realized it was as cut and dried as you spent 20 years doing class A's to protect yourself from being hurt or from feeling any kind of pain. And in the process, completely derailed my life, of course. Mm. And I was just like, my life. Yeah, because at the moment of taking drugs, you know, we're not aware that that's what's going on. No. Filling a void that we're unaware of because we're using drugs. Our mind and our bodies aren't connected. And, I mean, certainly for me, it was – you know, this not feeling, and, and I speak like I was aware that I was doing it at the time, but I wasn't. It was like, yeah. okay, I've got to go and do this now, whatever set fact it is. If I use this particular drug, it's going to get me through, then I can use a particular drug to be able to sleep, to yes. be able to switch off without yeah. my mind racing because mm. it's like that, like the, and, and not being able to get a grasp on how I'm feeling. Whereas mm. the work that I've done today is I'm accepting of it. My past doesn't define me. No. But I do use my past experience to then help other women. I don't like the coaching I do isn't in recovery. I don't. I do sponsor women, and I've got some great sponsors. I'm sponsored myself by a great woman. But the coaching I do, I personally think it's kind of an equate to anyone. You know, like that feeling like you're worthless, feeling like you don't matter, feeling like mm-hmm. actually I might as well stick a needle of heroin in my body with you know, not God knows what what's been in it because I ain't worth nothing. Mm. You know, and trying to switch that around yeah you know, it's really powerful you know but yeah. not, not aware we're doing it are we we're not aware no. that, you know, and this yeah. is the problem I think you know because there's so much opinion out there that it's a choice and nobody forced you to put that into your arm right but therefore you chose it. But did you choose it? Like the fact that that seemed like the best option at the time tells us about the level of despair right internally. <laughs> Hmm. I don't think I don't think, you know, in my younger years, I had a choice. I don't, no. you know, no. I mean, when you're 11. No, certainly not. <laughs> no, I don't think there's a, you know, the conscious thing. Um, I will say I was always a bit of a rebel. I was always a bit of, um, you know, wanting to be that party girl, wanting to be noticed. So it's going to come hand in hand. But I do believe now. In recovery, knowing what I know, having some weight about me, doing some personal growth, finding some personal insight and moving forward that today it's a choice. Because yeah. I have two different I'm, lives and two different worlds to be able to go, okay, mm-hmm. I'm a grown ass woman and I can make that conscious decision. So, for example, when I picked up and my dad died, like I hear people say, oh, you know, I lost my clean time. No, 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 no. I threw it away. I was yeah. constantly aware of yeah. what was going on, but I just didn't have, I didn't have the ability 
to cope with my grief or the abandonment that I felt. I mean, the guy died for God's sake. Yeah. Um, it just triggered the life out of me. Yeah. But it was still a choice at that point, you know. But you've come back. You've yeah. come back. Longer. Which is amazing. So tell us, what does recovery look like to you? What does recovery mean to you? Okay. Um, recovery for me um, was recovering parts of myself that I wasn't even aware of. Okay. You know, recovery for me is being my true, authentic self un unapologetically. Like, uh, you know, th th simple things like saying no to people, not people pleasing, standing in my true power of who I am. Yeah. Voicing and I ain't everyone's cup of tea. And I'm all right with that. Like, I want everyone to love me, but I don't give a fuck if you don't. Genuinely. Exactly because you know what? Today I like me. I don't mm -hmm. need to use a substance to feel good about myself, to wake up in the morning and feel good. And I don't get me wrong, not every morning do I wake up and it's like, la, 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 la. Like, <laughs> but like no? sometimes I really have to practice that gratitude. And sometimes I have to really stop and look at my blessings to get to the point of la, 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 la. But a lot of mornings I do wake up. Like this morning, I woke up and it was like, today's a good day. Yes. The sun is shining. Exactly. I have food in my cupboard. My child's home isn't being bombed. Like, you know, like real basic stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't watch yeah. the news, but I'm clearly aware of what's going on in the world. Yeah. Yep. Like just being grateful for the moments. But I didn't need to practice that this morning. It, was just, it just came. Mm. You know, also, recovery yeah. for me is, is helping other people, like being of service to somebody that, for example, I do a 12 step program, which I've said, and I go to meetings and I can see a woman walk in and just see she's made from my cloth. She's yeah. had my experiences yeah. different in, 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 in various arenas, but we are of the same. Yeah. And then connecting with that woman and not even necessarily sponsoring her, just letting her know it's going to be okay. Let yeah. her know if, if nothing else is my number and I will be there. And seeing yeah. that, come on, seeing that human being like, just sat a little bit. Like the yeah. women, that, women that I work with in recovery, and I'm going to talk about the coaching, but in recovery, the women I work with, like well, I had a conversation with one and said, I'm not going to blow her up because I just, I'm not just not going to do that. But having this conversation, having them light bulb moments, that lit me up. Yeah. That's absolutely. what life's about, you know, helping each other and becoming who we're supposed to be. That was a very long answer. Is what was recovery? No. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it because there's so much resonance and recovery is different for all of us. Yeah. Our recovery is our recovery. It's a very personal journey, but there's a lot of resonance. And I think for me, the authenticity thing is the main piece. You know, it's been it, and it continues to be a journey. So what I wanted to maybe touch on now was like I met Liz actually for the listeners. I met Liz in a mastermind program that we were in last year with the amazing Dante and Vicky Killian, who were freaking fabulous. Mm -hmm. um and we were you know there supporting each other building our businesses mm -hmm. and you know we've come along in leaps and bounds in the last year right um so I wondered if you might share with some of the listeners today Liz about you know what is going on for you business wise okay so um I've got a few things that are going on um Ooh. so I know uh, one of the things that I've got real passion about, and obviously, you know, my intro in here, you know, I'm uh, an empowerment coach. And that is where, for me, my real passion lies. When I coach women, and I, I no offence men, but I don't coach mm -hmm. women. And the reason <laughs> I don't coach men is because I still have that negative thinking sometimes around men. So you yep. come to me as a man, and because of my past, mm -hmm. I come from a judgmental place. And that's nothing to do with them. It's everything to do with me, which is why I don't coach men. You know, right, you are. And I, I know there's amazing men out there. So this is why I don't do it, because it's detrimental to them. It's detrimental to me. But when I'm coaching women, not women in recovery, it's not it's not an arena that I coach. But when I coach women that come to me and they've got low self-esteem, low self-worth, they don't like themselves. And then in a three to six month period, see them come alive, whether that be in a business arena, whether that be in their relationships, whether that be in how they're parenting or just raising that self-worth. The last couple of clients I had were full-time mums and wanted to get back into the workforce but had zero confidence, zero self-esteem. And it's about lifting that up and then yeah. seeing them come alight and then they're flying. They're like, I try and ring them and like, I'm busy, Liz, I'm working. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, my work here is done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my work, yeah. Now, now, now go, my children, into the fog. <laughs> it is 
so good isn't it and this is the reason why i'm a coach as well you know just seeing people have those light bulbs go off seeing people suddenly connect with who the fuck they are suddenly seeing people like just come alive and step into the light it is magical isn't it, it really i love is. it and, and you know i love it. Thing i like about coaching is that it's not like Oh, you know, I'm a coach and dog. It's constant personal development, constant growth, constantly working on myself, communicating with other coaches, see what they're doing. You know, you know, swapping ideas like me and you have. You yeah. know, and that that because for me, constantly growing into the woman I'm supposed to be is the greatest journey. Mm -hmm. you know, it's cool. one of the, you know, and just understanding and uncovering who I am. I just believe I'm fluid. I'm like a river. I'm constantly moving. I'm constantly yeah. changing. Things yeah. are always, there's always something to be learned, always something to be uncovered. Oh, yeah. But then if I can then pass that to another warrior woman, I'm there. Pass the baton. I love your energy, Liz. I absolutely love it. And this is why I think, you know, we connected in the first place. Hey, so tell me, do you know what's just come into my head is about communities? Because I know that you've worked a 12 step program and this is not, not an avenue that I took myself personally. But through my own recovery coaching training, I suddenly realised the value of a community and all of those things that you probably tried to tell me that I just didn't really listen to, if I'm honest. Um, and so I wondered if you would share with the listeners, you know, what is the value of having a community around you of others that are on the same path, on the same journey, that are, you know, moving in the same direction from your perspective? For me, when I was um, out there using I, it was just me. I had no connection with anybody. I had no connection with staff. It's not like I had friends. Like I had people I used with. Like, and some of those people I've used with are dead. Some of the people I've used with, uh, you know, have, have come into recovery and, and we're still friends. But I was always alone. Mm -hmm. The beauty of having a community of like-minded people that understands me because they're, they're made of me. They are yeah. the same as me. They suffer from the disease of addiction. It's like I'm never alone. And being connected to people that are on that same path, different stages, but on that same path of self-discovery and remaining in an abstinent program at any time of the day or night. OK, maybe not three o'clock in the morning, but <laughs> I can I can call somebody. Yeah, I can phone up and they would I can go right. Here's a real wackadoodle thought. I can't sleep because my head is really busy. My disease is louder than my own personal thoughts and then go. I understand. Me too. Yeah. You say that to people that haven't got a, 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 an addiction issue or anything like that. They're like, "What? What are you talking about? Your head's loud." Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's just, and that's just a little, you know, one side of things. But I can turn up, and I've done meetings in Turkey. I've done meetings in India. You know, wow. I've done, yeah. You know, you can go anywhere around the world, turn up to a meeting, and you will be welcomed like you're one of the family. Mm -hmm. I never had that. I never had that when I was out there. Yeah. Like, turning up to a meeting in my local area and most people hugging me and going, you're right, Liz, how are you doing? And genuinely saying to me, how are you? And, yeah. mean, and wanting the answer. It's not just yeah. like passing the night, yeah, you're all right. It's yeah, actually, yeah. are you okay? Yeah. And me having that same affinity and bond and, and love for somebody I might only see in a meeting once a week, but actually yeah. I'm championing them. I am yeah. chewing them on and I know they're doing the same for me. I never yeah. had that. Never had that when I was out there. And I've only, if I'm being really honest, developed and started to get that over the last eight years, like before my relapse. My saving grace was that I'd made huge connections with some amazing women in the fellowship that I'm part of. Yeah. And if it wasn't for them, me wanting to be like them, their strength, their courage, the way they held themselves, I believe my relapse would have been really different. Mm -hmm. really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like having faith in it, isn't it? Yeah, it's like having a community. It's like having, like, rather than just having two best friends, it's like you've got an army of them. Yeah. You've got an army. And, like, the, the other thing with community, I mean, I, like I've, I've briefly touched on it, my negative thinking around men, um, and it's not men. I, again, I'm going to say that. It's <laughs> my thinking from, you know, obviously my, my, my past and, and everything that I went yeah. through, but it's the men within the fellowship and the community that I'm in that I call friends that have shown me that that's not the truth of all men. Yeah. Because yeah. I've got a little boy. I've got a little seven-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. I have to challenge that rhetoric. I have to challenge that thinking because I'm raising a boy. Yeah. You know, so, and there's so much more about having a community, like just feeling connected and, and that you belong to something, that you're part of something. 
you know, it, it, for me, it, it instilled great personal value. But people yeah. give a shit. People give a shit. Yeah. So yeah. I start to give a shit about me. Mm-hmm. Because I think, you know, addiction thrives in isolation, doesn't it? You know, I yes. fought a silent battle for a really, really long time and certainly didn't want to tell anybody because not even because of judgment, but because, well, they were going to expect me to do something about it. And I didn't want to do something about it, quite frankly. Um, but, you know, being able to have these conversations, like I know you were one of the people that I called when I had my little moment, um, you know, and you were straight there when the end of the phone didn't really know me that well, you know, but you gave, were able to give me some really sound advice and help and support and all of that stuff. And I was in that moment where I was like, fuck, what have I done? Um, and, and, you know, that's important. That yeah. is super important because, as you say, you know, I, I did tell my mum, but she was just like, well, you know, what, you know, coming from a place where she doesn't understand it like how you did, yeah? yeah? And I just think it's really important for all of us in recovery to have at least one person who else is in recovery around us mm. to to keep us straight and to understand us. That's what we want as humans, isn't it, right? Connection and understanding, validation. We want to be seen, heard, understood. Those are like our pivotal things that we strive upon, right? Mm. And just having someone, and I know it's a bit of a hashtag these days, but someone to go, me too, me yeah. too. Yeah. Makes you feel like yeah. you're not alone. I'm not a complete, you know, wackadoodle. I, you know, somebody else understands what I'm saying when I'm not yeah. really clear on what my head's saying. You know, mm-hmm. and like you said, having somebody that you just pick up the phone to, it's not going to judge the hell out of you. It's yes. just going to be like, I get it. I understand. Yeah. This is what I done when I was in mm-hmm. that situation. Or yeah. just, or even not even to offer advice, just to listen. Yeah. Exactly that. But sometimes I'm a, I'm a fucking talker. I'm a, <laughs> but sometimes, <laughs> Just picking up the phone and someone just to listen because I do believe we all have the answers inside of ourselves. I I believe that from here to here to then here, Mm. sometimes it just takes somebody who understands you, who doesn't not going to judge you, just to listen. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And so actually, on the back of that, I am creating a recovery community of my very own. Um, so for the listeners out there that are not aware of this right now, I've only spoken about it very briefly online. Um. But I'm creating a recovery community called Recovery Central because recovery is central to freaking everything right about now. Um, and this is going to be a paid community. And the reason why I've made it a paid community is for two reasons. First of all, we happily spent our money on drink, drugs, whatever the fuck it was that we were killing ourselves with. And if we can do that, we can most certainly invest that very same money into ourselves and creating the life that we have always wanted to live, yet we're never able to have access to because we were addicts, right? The second reason is because you show up differently. When you know that you've paid for something, you're going to show up in a way that says, hey, I'm going to get value out of this, right? So the community is going to be £30 a week to join. My first 10 members are going to get access, lifetime access for just £15 a week. And the idea of it is to create the space that you have just basically described this, you know, where I am going to show up as the leader that I am, as the addict that I have been, as the mum that I am, as the business coach that I am, as the recovery coach that I am, as the spiritual life coach that I am, right? You will get all of that from me. You will get support, mentorship, guidance, you know, and a community of people that are just waiting to be your friend, right? And to care about you. So I would love, love, love to share that with you peeps. If you're interested in that, drop me a message. I've got my email address scrolling across the screen there. It's the recoverywitch2911 at gmail.com. You can find me over on Facebook, okay? Um, so that will be going live probably next month, actually, now. Um, but I'm looking for my founding members. As I say, lifetime access, £15 a week. You know, this is less than the price of what we would freaking spend on our poison of choice. So send a message to yourself. You are worth it. So with all of that said, Liz, any closing hints, tips, insights, wisdoms to share? And I've put you on the spot there, but you're full of it. <laughs> I need to make this levitatingly profound. <laughs> and actually, it's not. It's really basic. Get connected. You know, if okay. you are struggling with any form of addiction, like reach out to anyone. You know, yeah. you'll be surprised how many people might not understand, but we're willing to help. And, yeah. you know, there's lots of different recovery models. You know, there's lots of different, you know, avenues you can go down. Um, I feel like I'm just live streaming to myself and I'm not sure where um, uh, Sarah has gone. But that would be my advice is to get connected. You know, whatever arena you can find recovery, then do that. 
Sarah, I'm not sure where you've gone, but all I can see is my own face. I think maybe you've been kicked off or not kicked off. Um, sorry. <laughs> Accident. Well, come back. I feel like I need to entertain now, which is a real defect of mine. I feel like I need to like do a little dance or sing, neither of which I can do. So, um, yeah, for those that are struggling, find a recovery community and get connected. Reach out, ask for help, find those people, find your tribe. And that might sound all really confusing, but it's not. Just show up for yourselves. Hopefully Sarah is going to come back any moment. With a bit of luck, because if not, I will be going. Um, okay. <laughs> Bizarre ending. Okay, so thank you for having me, Sarah. Thank you for um, inviting me to uh, share my story with your audience. Um, God bless. <laughs>